Ephesians 1, 13. 1, 13, 14. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that the Holy Spirit of promise, which is earnest in our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession into the praise of his glory. Response. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, it generates a response in those who hear it. Now, Brother Robert got up here, he said everyone responds, some in a positive way, some in a negative way, and this witness is true. But what I'm going over are valid responses, good responses, indications that a person has truly taken in the word and believed it, taken it as, as a true record from God. But what kind of things happen when the gospel is heard? That's what I'm kind of looking into. The gospel is designed to generate certain kinds of responses. Now, I'm going to show you what those are. Now, this passage that Sister Hannah read, you're going to want to book that, bookmark that for now. Because I want to start a message like this the right way. And that involves getting credit, giving credit where credit's due. If any man has given a valid response to the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's because God's been at work in that person. So we are not talking about something that's solely based on human response. I want to make it clear here. And thank God that it's not. Our response is a result of a divine working. And no man should stumble at this being so. The response is required. But let's look at why men respond in a good way. Why did you come? Let's look at the background here. Now consider this saying in the scriptures. He who hath an ear to hear... Let him hear. Now, I, I picture that being said where everyone can hear it. You imagine the Lord Jesus saying, He who has a word ear to hear, let him hear. No. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Everyone, listen up. Jesus' words penetrate all ears. Now, in Matthew through Revelation, you'll read that in the red print 17 times. He who hath an ear, let him hear. And I trust you know this isn't talking about these ears right here. It's not. This is talking about a capacity to take in the words that are spirit and life. Amen. Amen. Well, consider this. Jesus says concerning those who heard his parables. You know, he talked in parables. These sounded like maybe simple life lessons to some people. Sowing. Man goes to a far country. Some people do the job. Some people don't do the job. Wedding feast. You know, there's a lot to pick from there. Good Samaritan. And so the disciples asked, they, I think they could sense there was more to these parables than just what people were hearing. It's like, why are you speaking to the crowds in parables? Well, Jesus tells them it's, give, it's not given to them to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but it is given to you. And he follows that up by saying, therefore, I speak to them in parables because they seeing, see not, and hearing, hear not, neither do they understand. That sounds kind of peculiar. They saw, but they didn't see. That's what he said. They heard, but they didn't hear. This is what he said. What was he talking about? When the he well, Hebrews, they're told they become dull of hearing. Remember that? You become dull of hearing, like you're going deaf. What was he talking about? Jesus even said, why don't you understand my speech? They heard what he said. He said, even so, you cannot hear my word. Why is he saying you can't hear my word when his words were clearly heard, you know, in one sense? Sounds like Jesus is referring to something different. We can see that Jesus is what he's talking about when he says, He who hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. All right, that kind of clarifies what he's talking about. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you hear him say that quite a bit. Jesus has gone on words, record saying, The words I speak, they're spirit and they're life. And people were hearing Jesus talk about, Eat my flesh and drink my blood, and they thought he was a cannibal. He tells them, The flesh profiteth nothing. My words are spirit and life. There's more to my words than what you're saying. Something needs to be opened up. 
requires the, requires the divine work. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So hearing comes too. So if you've responded well, give thanks Jesus gave you ears to hear. Give thanks. Also consider Lydia, who in Acts chapter 16 it says, whose heart the Lord opened. Doesn't this precede a valid response? There are hard hearts, they're like a closed door, but an open heart welcomes in the message of the gospel. It's an important thing to take note of. It's God who prepares the heart to believe on his son. Isn't this what was said to the eunuch? He said, what's stopping me from being baptized? He says, if you believe with all thine heart, then you may. And then he, Paul writes to the Romans, with the heart, man believes. With the heart. Men today demand, now, men have like to persuade you to their way of thinking today. They have their fancy arguments, superior intellect, and they like to require open minds. You need to be, have an open mind before you hear what I have to say. Men will say this a lot, which all that is translated in modern terminology as, you need to be willing to admit that I'm right. That's all people mean when they say that. But it was not Lydia's mind that the spirit records was opened. It was her heart. If you respond well, God opened your heart so that you could receive. Provision was made for you to take in that good news. He, he opened it up so you have a place to put it. Also consider this, being drawn by the Father proceeds. A valid response. In fact, according to the words of Jesus, if God doesn't draw you, you don't come at all. No man come unless the Father first draws him, he said. Jesus said it, it is therefore true. But let's be clear, this is not being hypnotized like a zombie. We're not talking about having a rope tied around the neck and drug like a man being dragged by a horse here. Those who come, they really do come. They are willing in the day of his power. They came independent. They wanted it for themselves. But man needs to be guided to find the right way. Amen. They have to. Jesus has gone on record to say that the way of life, it's narrow, narrow, and few there be that find it. Now men have taken this to mean that an itty bitty tiny number of humanity is gonna to get to heaven. Well, the vast majority is gonna perish. But luck, maybe you'll be part of this itty bitty number that find that way to life. That's what people take this passage to mean. This is absolutely not so. For the Spirit declares that the number that shall be saved will be a great multitude, which no man could number. Man, human mind is not capable of calculating this number with all its machines, all its methods. It cannot come up with that number. Now we know the number of the enemy, they were like the sand of the sea, okay, that's calculable. But this was not calculable. There's nothing in the earth you could liken it to. It's beyond this realm's capacity to count. That doesn't sound like a few. The Savior's point is that the way to destruction is easy, requiring little effort or strength, while the way that leads to life is hard. It's hard, difficult, requires much strength, perseverance, and divine power. Now I will say, if salvation relied solely on human response, the idea that the majority of parish would be a valid, I would say that. If that's all, if it was just up to men to decide God had nothing to do with your response, I would say yes, the majority would perish. But God draws men. Jesus is bringing many sons to glory. It says many, right? Not a couple, many sons to glory. It is with great difficulty that the right way is found. So in view of that, be thankful that God draws men. Give thanks for a drawing God. But it may be hard for men to find it, but it's not hard for God to draw men to it and keep them along the way. That's not hard for God. For this reason I rejoice knowing it is not of him that willeth, or him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. And we're talking about the basis of mercy and compassion. I'm thankful that that's not based on me earning that. I didn't earn the right to be drawn or shown mercy, but God showed it. So if you responded well, God led you to a place where you could respond. Also, you could respond due to receiving a love for the truth. Now there were some who were sent strong delusion because they didn't receive this love. But I can see that's not the case concerning you. Consider that though, receiving love for the truth. If it was received, then it was given. There's a kind of love that God can, only God can put in a man's heart. He gave it, you received it. I mean, the fact that you're even taking this in, you received that. You received that from him. 
If you responded well, then you've taken hold of what God has held out to you. And the truth requires a certain kind of affection that will drive men to pursue it. I'm thankful God authors that affection. Amen. Now all these things, though, are tied to the hearing of the gospel message. God's not going to give you ears to hear a lie. He's not going to open your heart to receive a truth that's nowhere to be found. He will not draw men without a destination to aimlessly wander. He will not give you a love for a truth that isn't being spoken. All it ties to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If he's being expounded, you could be rest assured these things are happening. To be more precise, God will not allow a message like the gospel he's spoken and nothing happened. He won't. There is going to be response to his message. Men will respond. His word will not return to him void. He will not be mocked. The gospel is effective due to a powerful God working through a message that came from him. If God is the origin of what is spoken, the results will testify. Now I'm going to go over two key words in this passage that's assigned to me. I'll read it here in a minute, but I'm going to deal with other passages too. Because I trust you understand a subject like this cannot be covered with just one passage. The passage assigned to me is merely a starting point. If you've played any board games, you'll see that mark. It's like, start here. Well, this is my start here. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. So let's look at some two key words in this passage where he talks about, in whom he trusted, that's one. That's a response right there. And he also talks about, after that, you believed. That's another response. So I'm going to touch on those right now. The brethren mentioned here trusted in God after they heard that word of truth. That was the response. Trust. Now, trust involves relying on somebody. And if you think about it, those who believe the gospel, they must trust on the Lord, for it only promises what God can give. What, who else is going to give you eternal life? Think about it. Who else can prepare a place for you outside the natural realm? Who else can create a new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness? Who else can distribute treasures in heaven? Who else can make you rulers over cities in the world to come? Who else can take away your sins and purge your conscience to serve the living God? Who else can do that? Who else can make you new creatures in Christ Jesus and make the old things pass away? Who else has that? In all these cases, we must trust on the Lord. This is certainly apply, this applies to all honorable areas of life. He provides for us in this world too. If I eat, I give thanks for God giving me that food. If I have a home, I thank God he sheltered me. If I'm safe, I thank God for his protection. If I'm alive, I, give, thank, I thank God who put the breath in my nostrils. If you're breathing right now, God's giving you that breath. Be thankful, you see trust in all areas of life. There are other things that can come to your minds, but I'm showing that trusting in God comes with the reality that all things are of God and that he is the true source of all blessings that come to us and that are common in the earth. And there are none that superior to him, no one stronger than God. No one can outdo God. That, that, pro that provokes people to trust in him. Trust, therefore, is a valid response for as a result of a man's awareness of his total dependence on God for salvation and his need for Jesus Christ. And it comes with the understanding that with God, all things are possible and that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen. You're nothing on your own. But the gospel declares who the source of life and blessing is. And you are not nothing with him. The other word used here is believe. It may seem like a simple textbook answer, but believing on the truth is no simple matter. How many people have you convinced that Jesus is Christ? From your personal experience, you should be able to acknowledge this is not always an easy thing to do. But let's be clear, with men this is not possible. With God all things are possible. He opened it up to you, didn't he? God, this isn't, I'm saying this isn't a problem for God, getting people to believe. You might think of our own efforts like, oh, I tried, I tried, and he won't listen to me. Well, God doesn't have these same kind of issues that you may have. So trust in God to do this. What I'm getting at is that men can only believe if God is involved. If you rely on your own means to persuade men of the realities of heaven, you're going to get frustrated really fast. For men to believe, they must hear a message that God works through. That being the gospel. Believing is a valid response because it's an acknowledgement that God's record is true. That God is the true God. 
It's a result of seeing God for who he truly is as revealed in scripture. And we're not talking about a version of God. People like to talk about versions of God. This God, that God. We're talking about the true God here, I trust. We're not talking about just our God. It's God, the true God. This is who we believe. If you believe God is, you will believe his words. Now, what other kind of responses result from the gospel? I want to share some more of these things with you. Now, you just heard a song played for you. Something Jesus said quite a bit to those who heard him. Come unto me. And this invite was given to draw those who are weak and heavy laden, thirsting for righteousness. If any man thirst, come to me. And it was even said to young children, who Jesus said, let the children come, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let them come. The children responded to Jesus. I would consider coming to Jesus a valid response for its confirmation that the message they heard is true. True gospel will cause men to come to Christ for all the right reasons. Sometimes the validity of a person's response is seen in where they go. They went to Christ where they heard the true message. All who are saved came to Jesus when they were called, not to someone else. They came to Jesus. We all met in the same spot. <laughs> now, when we believe the gospel, repentance follows. You've read about this? Repentance from dead works, the scripture says. It's a valid response to the gospel. Now, when the gospel is preached, it will cause men to forsake their old lives. It detests sinful living. Things they might have enjoyed at one point, now, it's, it, now they're spitting it out like poison. It's not the same anymore. It's not as good, especially when contrasted with what the Lord has promised. It's not as good. They won't want to live in sin anymore when confronted with Christ. Even harlots and publicans came to listen to Jesus. Well, why? Why were there harlots around Jesus? I think people who bring this up need to think about this. Jesus hung out with harlots. Okay, well, why were there harlots around Jesus? Was it because he was a lascivious heartthrob charmer? Was that why? Why were there tax collectors around Jesus? Did he have a lot of money? Did he have a lot, was, did, was he promoting greed, contributing to their way of life? Maybe, just a thought, maybe harlotry didn't sound so good anymore. That's why the harlots came to Jesus. Maybe the tax collectors came to Jesus because he offered something better than money. Money doesn't sound so good anymore. And I'm sure you can remember it yourself that day where you said, I don't want to live this way anymore. I don't want it. Get it away from me, or get me out of here, whatever it was. Lord, save me. It's a deliverance either way, whatever you look at. It's a deliverance any way you look at it. Jesus delivered you from something you once were enslaved to. But it's a, that's a valid response, repentance. Men are in reverse because of Jesus. They're going the course of this world, and now they've done it like a 180. Now they're going this way, the exact opposite of what they were doing before. Some people, they know your name, they know what you look like, but they, like, they don't even recognize you. Like, this can't be the per The person I know wouldn't do that. You hear people say things like this. The person I know wouldn't do that because I'm not the person you knew. That's why. And God can testify to that too. People who are living for themselves are now doing the opposite of what they did before. So indeed, I say a complete turnaround results from Jesus. If a person has completely turned their life around, I'd say they've given a valid response to the gospel. They've heard the truth. Those who repented particularly at Pentecost, they were commanded to be baptized, which that's also a valid response. I'm just going to cite this, the things that were associated when you were baptized into Christ. It says, buried with Christ, buried with him. I like hearing that, buried with him, raised to walk in newness of life, putting on Christ. Those of you who've been baptized in Christ, you put on Christ. Wonderful. A circumcision made without hands. A divine operation. All this has taken place. These are all things God does. God does all this. All these things taking place when a person is baptized into Christ. However, I will point this out. Do you read of anyone in Scripture having to be told all of these things before getting baptized? Argued with, convinced about this? No. They heard the command and they responded accordingly. That's what baptism is. It's a response to the gospel and one that will greatly benefit the believer. You see, in baptism, new life is birthed. It's birthed, born again. And to me, a 
refusing to be baptized is just as silly as telling a pregnant woman, you don't have to give birth to that baby. Just let it grow up, you'll like it in there. No, new life has to be birthed, brethren. And I'm sure you can trust by experience the benefits that come along with that. Profound expression, godly living, that comes from birthing what God has put in you. Obeying the gospel is certainly a valid response. There's also the matter of forsaking. You can see this in response of the fishermen who dropped their nets when Jesus called them. He said, come follow me. You're going to catch men if you follow me. You've done a similar thing, I trust. God called you away from something. Jesus said that all who forsake are blessed by God. Forsake for him, I mean. You'll find you did have to leave something to get to Jesus. It may not all be the same thing. All of us have different things, we've different backgrounds, different things that were hindering us, but he all called us in a similar way. Maybe where you lived, you might have to leave a place you were living for all your life to follow Jesus. It may have been your family. It may have been even your career, whatever it was. It was something that competed with Jesus Christ. And when Jesus made the call, you defaulted to Jesus and you forsook. That shows a valid response. Because a false Christ won't prompt people to leave. They will stay. Jesus says, if any man come after me, he's moving through. And people left something to go after him. Amen. You can recall this in your own mind. If you respond to the gospel, you forsook something that hindered you. That was valid. But let's look at the other part of that. We did forsake, but it was not so that was it not so that we might follow the Lord Jesus? Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. I was freed up so I could follow Jesus. Amen. I mean, think about it. Picture the lame man. He's sitting there at that gate day after day, year after year, and he's begging for alms. He can't move. Someone has to bring something to him, food, something. And then the Lord Jesus would touch that man and give him the ability to walk again. And the man would say, he'd stand up and see, he'd walk and say, thank you. And then he'd sit back down again and start begging again. It would be absurd. And no Christian should ever do this. <laughs> no one should abuse that liberty that they've been given. Get up and walk. <laughs> Get up and walk. How much more absurd is it not to follow the one who has the words of life? Think about it. What kind of mindset comes with following Jesus? A person who follows Jesus, they follow with this mindset. To whom else shall we go? Are you going to go away too? Where else are we, we going to go? You're the one with the words of life. And so that kind of mindset will keep you with Jesus. You won't leave. You'll, he'll be on the move. You'll be right there with him the whole time. Regardless of where he goes, you'll be there. You see, when we hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, we don't hear about a Savior. We hear about the only Savior, the one Savior, that can, the one man who could save you from your sins. Therefore, following Christ's valid response for the gospel declares Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And if one person is convinced of that, they will follow also, the response to the gospel is seen in one's anticipation of what is promised in it. We are called to a lively hope in Christ Jesus. It's a hope that does not disappoint or make ashamed. It is a sure hope that is sure to happen as the setting sun. No one questions whether that's going to happen. No one should question the promises of God. With that hope comes watching, looking, pondering, anticipation, expectation. Sometimes a person will say, look over there. People will look. They will. They'll look exactly where you're pointing. Well, the gospel tells you to look somewhere. And so your, your response is to look for that thing that's been promised. Those who have believed the promises of God, they're looking for their fulfillment. Looking for the fulfillment of what God has promised is surely a valid response to the gospel of Jesus. This response is the most blessed one, for it involves speech. In the scriptures, it speaks of those who cannot help but speak the things which they have seen and heard. Likewise, those who have taken in truth, they have kind of a similar experience with it. We talk about the things that we love. I mean, I'm not up here speaking just out of mere obligation or forcing my way along here. I know when you got the invite, whatever, of the topics, no one had to tell you, okay, you can't talk about this. This is a, this is a church meeting now. You can't talk about this. You can't talk about this. You can only talk about this. No one had to be told that because the people that were invited loved the truth. And all they had to do was be said, 
talk about this, there's no concern about whether or not you're going to hear truth when they speak because they love it. We talk about the things that we love. You think like a man who can't get in the door as soon as he kicks the door down? Well, that's kind of like what the truth's been to my mouth. It can't be contained. It's going to get out. <laughs> and I'm not exactly like a big talkative person. I can be a very bashful person. Sometimes people haven't, they go days without hearing me talk. But when it comes to Jesus, I don't stay silent. Amen. We even had some sisters come up here who testified they didn't have a lot of experience speaking, but they spoke like they've been doing it their whole life. Profound truths. They didn't shy away from an opportunity to share. And likewise, you'll find this in your experience. When the truth comes up, you'll speak. <laughs> you, can't, you can't help it. You know, people say this is an excuse. I can't help it. Well, hey, this is in the scripture. I can't help but speak the things that I've seen and heard. And that's a valid, in that case, that's a valid use of that terminology. We don't have this excuse for sin, but when it comes to the truth, yes, you can say, I can't help it. <laughs> no apologies. <laughs> I'm happy to not be able to help this. Truth is not taken in so it can hibernate, but so that it can be spoken. Therefore, you're speaking what you've seen. That's like you responding to what you've heard, sharing it. You know, Jesus had to tell people to be quiet or not say something after he did a work. Think about that. He had to tell them, don't tell anybody. Why? Do you... It's because they would have said something. That's why. Well, Jesus isn't telling all of us, be quiet, brethren. <laughs> it's okay to speak now. Say on, I say, those of you who have something to share. Now, in all these things, they're all valid responses, but response isn't limited to just your initial reaction to the gospel, nor should it be considered so. You'll find yourself responding quite a bit to other things as you grow up in Christ. I mean, you heard, put off the old man, you responded to that. You told, set your affection on things above, you responded. You said, put on the armor of God, you responded. I would even go as far as say if there's a hearty amen or a hallelujah, that's a, that's a, that's a valid response. That's a response to the gospel. You'll find many others, but the gospel isn't just the thing that got you in. It's keeping you in too. Even like this week, the things that you're hearing, you're still responding to what you're hearing. We've heard exhortations. We've heard admonitions, encouragement in certain areas. And so you eat in every message, you have an opportunity to act on what you've heard. To respond what are you going to do with what you've heard so valid responses don't end at the initial stage they go on until you're dead they continue on Amen. but your response as you continue to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ you're showing you're born of God it's showing something about who you really are in your response you're demonstrating that your life is being lived out if a man is alive to God, he not only gave those initial valid responses, but he's still giving valid responses today to the word of God. Valid responses, therefore, are not just a mere flashback, but a constant way in which the might, power, wisdom, and glory of God are demonstrated in those who belong to him.